Hello and welcome to News Click. We have with us today Professor Evan Moglen, who has been one of the major figures in fighting various software cases, also including encryption. I think one of the first cases he took up in the US was regarding encryption violations or the US law regarding encryption violation. Evan, good to have you with us. Pleasure to be here. Could you tell us about why is encryption so important for countries that there is such a lot of restrictions on export of encryptions, various other things that the government seems to want to control in terms of encryption? In the course of the 20th century, public order became even more dependent than in the past on interception of communications. Government, every government, whatever government it was, whether it was the government of the United States or that of the Soviet Union or the government of India, depended for the maintenance of public order on surveillance and communications interception. Spying, military activity, terrorism, and even simple suppression of criminal activity all came to hinge on the ability to listen to what people say how their telephone calls and telegrams and other communications express their intentions, their capabilities, and their actions. In the world of the digital communications revolution, the ability to keep a secret hinges on encryption. That is, on the ability to turn a document or a film or a sound recording into an unmanageably garbled piece of numbers, just some stray random bits that can be reassembled by a trusted party into the original content, the video, the email message, or whatever. Moreover, encryption, in addition to being the counterpart of the way that public order is kept, is also in the digital world the, the source of authentication. If you want to authenticate that I am Eben, one way to do it over the net is to send me something that only Eben can read, and then ask me whether I know what it says. If I can reply by reading a message addressed to me secretly, then I am who I am purporting to be. All of our browsers talking to all of our banks, all of our banks talking to all of our landlords, all of our retail stores talking to all the banks and to us, are all engaged in using encryption in that latter way to authenticate the reality of the person with whom they are dealing, as well as to keep secret what is being said so that credit card numbers, checking account numbers, and other secrets aren't stolen. So encryption becomes an immense source of government interest and concern because it tends to negate public order keeping. Terrorists keep secrets and plan events and government doesn't know what's going on until it's too late. It governs authenticity, which means government finds that the digital economy depends upon the very encryption it might otherwise wish to suppress. And it controls how people understand their relations to one another. Are we in private? Are we public? Is what I'm saying to you visible to everybody or only to you and me? And as we become more used to the net as the way we do everything we do, encryption and authentication become how we determine what our lives consist of. Secrets or public statements, shared intentions or completely un traceable scams. So everybody worries about encryption quite a lot. Both government and civil society discover that things they used to think of in terms of political power are now really issues about the technology of encryption. So do you see a conflict between the requirements of the state to have surveillance for quote unquote maintenance of public order and for the need for strong encryption, particularly for financial transactions? Yes, unfortunately, there's a direct conflict, which is why when one watches public policy being either made or discussed as though the questions had simple answers, you know that you're being fooled. Unfortunately, there is an intrinsic relationship of conflict between the desire to have a secure and effective global or even national economy in the 21st century and the desire to have some man in some police agency listening to every dangerous thing that is said. 
Freedom has costs, and the free market, that is a globally effective market in which goods, services, and capital move about, and on the other hand, freedom in the sense of the ability to resist government repression on the one hand and lawless violence on the other, are all, as I said, locked up in this questions about encryption and privacy in the network. And anybody purporting to give a simple answer on any of the facets isn't really telling you about the whole stone. Do you think that some of the things the United States government, for instance, did, banning anything larger than 40-bit keys, insisting that whatever was shipped out of the United States had to be had very low level of encryption possibilities, all this in fact has led to long-term damage in the of the financial structures of the financial economy? What we lost because before the very end of the Clinton administration, the United States government did all of that controlling you speak of, what we lost was the opportunity to have digital cash. In other words, we lost the ability to relate untraceably to our purchases in the digital economy. Like everything else, this is neither simply good nor simply bad. Tax law is more effective around the world than digital cash would have ever permitted it to be. Money laundering, so-called, is much more difficult because digital cash relationships do not exist. There is no simple way to get 50,000 US dollars or 100,000 Great British pounds from one corner of the globe to the other without having to traceably interact in authenticated ways. That's to the good of a whole range of human activity, but it has also had unintended consequences that are very, very serious. We lost our privacy on the net because people started keeping track of all our transactions. People know everything we buy and sell on the net, everywhere we travel and for which we make a reservation on the net. Google knows everything that we think on the net because we find ourselves using technologies built at a time when using strong encryption to sustain privacy was simply not an option. And now most of us who were alive then, that is everybody who was alive in the first decade of the 21st century, we have irreversibly given up our privacy. We are predictable to those who know everything we've bought and everything we've sold and every place we've gone. And even if the net were to change tomorrow into one in which strong encryption guaranteed privacy, we and all the people who interact commercially through the net now would remain far too predictable and too, far too commercially knowable for any maintenance of what we used to think of as the privacy of private life. Currently, there is a huge battle going on between government of India and RIM on the issue of encryption or access to what RIM is providing its corporate clients and even in certain services. Do you think this is an issue that really has implications for security or do you, do you think this is just turf war? Regrettably, it does show the difficulty that arises from public policy made on the basis of supposedly simple answers to supposedly simple questions. For a variety of well-known reasons, the 7-Eleven events most important among them, the government of India is determined to restore as far as it can to itself the power the 20th century governments used to think they had of monitoring communications. The government of India announced last year that it was going to achieve the technical capacity to listen to every phone call and email message and SMS sent in India in order to preserve public peace and security. It turns out, not surprisingly, that they didn't mean they were going to get that capacity by spending the money to build it. They meant they were going to get that capacity by beating up on providers to provide it to them, which arguably, but only arguably, I think the statute law here in India allows them to do. So RIM is an example of an early effort by the government of India to make good on its promise to monitor all digital communications, beginning by making RIM turn over at least something that allows them to surveil the communications of among the least dangerous and most powerful people in the Indian economy, namely those who are with or interact with the MNCs that control global finance and trading, all of whom use BlackBerry networks because they're secure networks for the very sorts of messages that insecurity means bankruptcy about. 
The consequence is that the government of India has purported to be doing a very simple thing, namely securing opportunity to maintain national security by starting at the very most complex and difficult end. Now, if I'm a policymaker, particularly a secret, a secret world policymaker, I can think of reasons why I, want, why I might want to do it that way. I can certainly think of reasons why I might want to give the government of India the benefit of making its citizens think that pursuing the multinational financial houses over the secrecy of their communications is crucial to national security. It would be very difficult to make that argument persuasively after you had listened to everything else in Indian society, so it does seem like a place it's not entirely surprising to start. Unfortunately, it's also unobtainable. If the reality were that the government of India were asking to listen to every message passed back and forth between all the banks and all the investment firms operating in the Indian economy, they would detach the Indian economy from the global financial system overnight. They're not going to do that any more than they would do it in any other way. It's too nationally expensive. They know that they are balancing national security against other considerations. They don't want to discuss that balancing because they would like citizens to believe that the problem is a comparatively simple one. The executive director of SFLC in India, my colleague Mishi Chaudhary, published an essay on this subject as the government was moving towards its August 31st deadline, saying it will be obviously necessary for government to make some statement about the basis on which it can declare victory, but it can't declare victory at the expense of connection to the global economy, and I think that's pretty much the way it has worked out. The government of India says to him, well, bring some of your computers here so if we climbed inside them, we might be able to do what we say we're going to do. And tell us that you're going to keep us informed of the ways in which your customers are being allowed to secure their communications. And maybe you could even give us access to the stuff they don't consider to be secure messaging, like show us their chat messages, which will simply cause them to instruct all their employees never to discuss anything of any purpose in the chat. And under those circumstances, we can declare that we have made victory over the MNCs. Then we can go and beat up the Indian telecommunications carriers with a full degree of confidence because they will see that we were willing to tangle with Citibank and Goldman Sachs and therefore we're certainly not going to be, uh, allow Airtel to tell us no. And that way, even if there are any difficulties in the legal framework, even if the statutory law isn't perfectly on their side, they have a strong chance of being able to bluff everybody out of the game. And if they're in charge of all the communications interception that they can get away with without leaving the global economy altogether, they'll have created more national security. They'll also have created more risk of a political roundup or repression or even some form of massive violence in the future because they will have compromised the security of people's political communications, a thing that a democracy ought not to do. How does the United States states achieve this kind of purpose because it's commonly understood or held that NSA pretty much listens to about everything going on in the world. The United States government achieves whatever the results are that it achieves and we're not in a position to say exactly what those results are because we'll never know but the United States government achieves it by using a superpower's resources. It's perfectly clear the Washington Post has published an extraordinary expose called Top Secret America on the web this year, which every citizen of the world can read. It's perfectly apparent that since September of 2001, there has been an enormous expansion in what was already the largest national security and defense budget in the world to listen to more communications and more importantly to conduct more data mining of available commercial intelligence on every everybody's activities in the internet in order to try to serve American national security interests. We're talking about a scale of spending which is larger than the entire Indian defense budget being spent to listen to the communications around the world of everybody who interacts with global communications networks. In other words, the equivalent of more than the Indian defense budget to listen to the roughly half the world that makes and receives telephone calls. It's a very good bargain for the United States. It's a very important part of the power of the post-war empire. 
If the United States stopped spending that money, it not only is convinced that it would have some episodes of terrorism in the United States, but more importantly, it would lose the immense clout which the United States government gained by its intelligence acquisition and processing activities after the Second World War. Thanks, Evan. I think this is very interesting for most of us who don't really understand Thanks, the secret world of communications today. Thank you. Thank you.